turn to the first chapter of uh, Amos. I'm going to take, take up again chapter, I'm at verse 13. Before we do that, though, let's uh, have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we ask that we bless the study of thy word, and we will learn the lessons of old that are just as fresh today as, it, as they were then. And we pray for this nation that it may not fall into the same sins as did those of Israel of old that required their prophets to go to them and warn them about their impending doom. So we ask a blessing upon this nation we ask that each one of us, as children of thine, would stand firm on the bedrock of thy word, and other never veer to the right or to the left, that this nation may at least have someone who is standing in the as bulwarks against unfaithfulness. This thing we these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> As I had mentioned last week, uh, <clears throat> Amos was sent to preach to Israel, but he didn't start out condemning Israel right away. <clears throat> he condemned uh, six, if you want to call them nations around about. Uh, they were not <clears throat> Israel or Judah condemned them first <clears throat> then he went from there a very short condemnation but went from there to condemn Judah and I think this had the effect of setting up Israel to acknowledge that what uh, Amos was going to tell them was true that they could not rebut it and they didn't you, you go through Amos, they didn't rebut it. They told him to stop doing it, but they could not rebut his charges. <clears throat> so in verse 13, he's making a charge against uh, Ammon. And uh, uh, like I say, this um, there's certain specific charges, but that's not to say that's the only thing that they were guilty of. This may be the most uh, pronounced sin but somebody that does these things they have a whole lot of other sins too but these are the ones just mentioned and the charge against Ammon is that they ripped open women with child in Gilead <clears throat> and they did it now this was not uh, unheard of in those times <clears throat> it's a very life is cheap and uh, people were very cruel. But the reason they did it was to enlarge their territory. They would conquer and, and do these horrible things that they might enlarge their territory. So the, the doom pronounced on them is that uh, there's going to be a fire. You know, when you, whenever you see this notion of fire, that means somebody is going to set it. Some outside force is going to set it. So that really means war. There's going to be a war, and it's going to uh, destroy them. It's going to devour their palaces, and uh, it's going to be there's going to be shouting in that day of battle, and there'll be a, a tempest in the day of whirlwind. Kings should go into captivity, and the princes together. So it's it's going to be a devastating uh, event for Ammon. It might make note of that all these six nations men mentioned no longer exist. In chapter 2, we come to the judgment on Moab. <clears throat> Same sort of wording, three transgressions of Moab and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. And the charge against them was that they burned the bones of the king of Edom to lime. And it's likely that's not the only one they burned and made lime out of it, but 
uh, that was the charge against them. So they said, uh, you're going to send a fire to Moab again. It's going to be war. And it's going to devour their palaces. And Moab is going to die in a tumult. Tumult. I mean, it's mass confusion. It's going to be a shouting and a trumpet sound. They're going to cut off the judge in its midst. The judges are the wise men, or the, the people that render judgment. They have to be wise men. They're going to be cut off. And all the princes are going to be slain. And Moab did, in fact, disappear. In verse 4, then he says about Judah, for three transgressions of Judah and for four, <clears throat> I will not turn away its punishment. The same wording. But it's not for moral, uh, if you want to call it moral sins or, uh, you know, crimes or things like that. It was that they were unfaithful because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandments. <clears throat> their lies led them astray, lies after which their fathers walked. So he's going to send a fire upon Judah. There's going to be war. And it's going to destroy Judah. And it's going to defy, uh, devour the palaces of Jerusalem. And that, in fact, did happen. So now he's uh, set the stage for his, the real purpose that he's there. Uh, and I can just see it in my mind's eye that uh, those Israelites were saying uh, for these first, you know, the seven punishments, and they said, yep, yep, yes, yeah, that's, that's it. It's going to happen. That's it. They deserve it. You, you got it. Preach on, brother. Preach on. <clears throat> so they had uh, put themselves in a very tight corner. <clears throat> they could not deny that his preaching against them was not justified. They couldn't say that. <clears throat> says, for three transgressions of Israel and for four I will not turn away its punishment. Because they sell the righteous for silver. And, and again, I did mention before that uh, Israel was very prosperous at this time because Syria was in a very weakened condition. So they were very prosperous. <clears throat> and uh, you know the story of how the separate nation of Israel came about when uh, Jeroboam I uh, rebelled against Rehoboam, and he didn't want the, Israel, the, the citizens of the northern kingdom to go down to Jerusalem, so he set up uh, idol worship in Bethel. So anyway, <clears throat> the poor, uh, they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pan after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor. They wouldn't even allow that to the poor. And a man and his father go into the same girl. This, this was a uh, religious prostitution is what it was. And they pervert the way of the humble. They defile my holy name. By their actions, they defile my holy name. They lay down on every altar and clothes, taking the pledge. You know, the uh, one could take a person's cloak and pledge but they had to return it before nightfall because they, you know, had to have something to sleep in. But they weren't doing that. They were drinking the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. You know, they would uh, uh, find people unjustly, of course, and, and they would buy wine for it and drink it. And... Uh, it was just a terrible time. He said, and yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them. He's presenting evidence whose height looked like the height of cedars. He was strong, but God overcame him. This is evidence that he could do what he said he did, uh, said he would do. They should have had uh, faith in him, but they didn't. He said, yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. 
And this uh, theme occurs and reoccurs again and again. In verse 10, it was I who brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. Now, the reason that this is mentioned time and time again is because this is proof that God could and would do what he said he would do. And that should have produced faith in these uh, Israelites. So I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is it not so, O you children of Israel, says the Lord? But you gave the uh, Nazarites uh, wine to drink. They weren't, weren't permitted to do that. So the Nazarites were uh, kind of a class of people who were to be very pure. But they forced them to violate their vows. But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. And this will, uh, this will happen to Amos, too. <clears throat> Now, there were prophets, of course, that were, uh, how you, would you say, uh, uh, paid prophets. You know, they, whatever you wanted to prophesy, they would do it. But these are prophets that are prophesying that which the Israelites did not want to hear. And he says, Behold, I'm weighed down by you, as a card is weighed down that full of sheaves. Therefore flight shall, shall perish from the swift. <clears throat> He's talking about doom. They're not going to be able to, I don't care how fast they are, they're not going to be able to escape. And it doesn't matter if you're strong, the strong shall not strengthen his power, nor shall the mighty deliver himself. He shall not stand who handles the bow, somebody that's skilled in the bow, you're not going to stand. The swift of, uh, foot shall not deliver himself. No use trying to run. You're not going to escape. And neither will the one that rides a horse. And the most courageous of men of might <clears throat> shall flee naked in that day. It may be because they were so beat up that they lost their clothes in the process, but also could mean that they left so quickly that they forgot the clothes. <laughs> in chapter 3, it says, Hear this word the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel. And we'll hear, we'll see this uh, verbiage again, this hear this word. Against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Well, he's, he knows all the families of the earth, but these were a, a chosen people. And since they were a chosen people, he had to punish them. They received the blessings of being the chosen people, so he had to punish them. <clears throat> And we come to this uh, very famous verse, or well-known verse, can two walk together unless they are agreed? Now, as a matter of um, uh, whether it's a truism or not, uh, if, if two, I don't care if it's criminal activity or uh, business activity or what, if people are acting together, then they're agreed. But that's not really what it's talking about here is talking about Amos is proclaiming the word of God so that they must be agreed. They're agreed on this doom that's coming to uh, Israel and he gives illustrations of that. Well a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey now this, this verbiage of lion roaring has occurred before and it'll occur again down verse 8 it occurred in verse 1, and it'll occur in verse 8 again. So who's doing the roaring here? Well, Amos is doing the talking, but it's actually God doing the roaring. And he does have a prey. 
It's Israel. But Israel allowed themselves to become the prey. Will a young lion cry out of his den if it has caught nothing? Well, the young lion has caught something. Israel. Will a bird fall into a snare on the earth when there's no trap for it? Well, there's two things. There has to be a trap for it first. And the bird has to fly down into it. And that's what uh, Israel has done. Will a snare spring up from the earth if it has caught nothing at all? Again, it has caught something. Israel. If a trumpet is blown in the city, will not the people be afraid? And that was a means of warning the people that danger was approaching. And the trumpet, in fact, was at that time being blown by Amos. He was proclaiming things that the people should have been afraid of. If there is, a, is calamity in the city, will not the Lord have done it? Well, in this case, calamity was going to come upon uh, this nation of Israel, city of Bethel, and the Lord is the one that will have done it, even though it may have been through the means of uh, some foreign nation. Surely, in verse 7, surely the Lord does nothing unless his, he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. And this is a very important uh, concept to keep in mind that when when God condemns there's always warning there's always warning there's, and every time that I can remember that uh, when someone was just caught completely unawares that what they were doing was wrong and were uh, condemned for it God warns them usually they don't do anything but he warns them Unless he reveals, in verse 8 it says, A lion is roared, who will not fear? The lion is roaring, and the people ought to fear. The Lord has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Amos had to prophesy, because the Lord had spoken to him. And he could not deny that that call to proclaim those things that Israel needed to hear. <clears throat> proclaim in the palaces at Ashdod and the palaces of the land of Egypt. And he's calling heathen nations. Assemble on the mountains of Samaria. He's wanting these heathen nations to be witnesses. See great tumults in her midst. And, and they're pressed within her. For they do not know to do right. And that's an important concept, I think, to keep in mind, is that when people do evil for so long, they begin to regard it as normal. And you think about this country. What's being regarded as normal nowadays? It's, it started some time ago. You know, we talked about uh, the way we used to know the, how the church was. We used to know a lot of things that are not the case now. And if you were to talk to some young people in college, and it's done quite often, they don't know what right is. They have no concept of it. But anyway, they do not know to do right, says the Lord, who store up violence and robbery in their palaces. And they did actually store up violence and robbery. The things they were taking from the uh, people, stealing, they were um, storing it or inventorying it in their palaces, maybe in the, in the uh, uh, as furniture or you know whatever else it may be, but they were storing it there. Verse 11, therefore, says the Lord, an adversary shall be all around the land completely surround them so no escape and he shall sap your strength from you and that can be because of the armies whittling away in them that can be because they're uh, 
uh, taking away all their uh, food resources and, and what have you. But these palaces are going to be plundered, so it says, and in fact, that did happen. In verse 12, as a shepherd takes from the mouth of a lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out. And since he was a shepherd, he knew what it was like to uh, find a lion that had eaten a sheep. And all he finds is just a leg bone, say. And he's famous as telling Israel, that's all people are going to find of you after this is all said and done. Said, so shall the children of Israel be taken out who dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed and on the edge of a couch. And, you know, your, the places that you repose are going to be uh, destroyed as well. Hear and testify against the house of Jacob, says the Lord, God of hosts. In that day I will punish Israel for their transgressions. I will also visit destruction on the altars of Bethel. Bethel is going to be done away with. And the horns of the altar shall be cut off. Where they were actually worshiping in Bethel is going to be destroyed. I will destroy, destroy the winter house along with the summer house. So they were uh, kind of living in the lap of luxury. They had a summer house and a winter house. But they're going to be destroyed. The houses of ivory uh, shall perish. So those houses are very well appointed. And the great houses shall have an end, says the Lord. In chapter 4, it says, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan. It may, you King, I mean, the King James may say kind. I'm talking about cows. But he's talking about the women. I don't know why they call women cows, but anyway. Who are on the mountains of Samaria? Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, the the women were doing uh, quite well for themselves. They oppressed the poor and they crushed the needy. So their only thought was uh, for themselves. You say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. They were only uh, concerned about their own pleasures. The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, behold, the day shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks. Anybody that's a fisherman knows that, you know, when you hook one, you got, you got the uh, fish by the mouth, the hooks in it. So these uh, women are going to be taken away in the same manner. You're going to take away them away with fish hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. And you will go out through broken walls. So the walls of the city are going to be broken down. Each one straight ahead of her, sort of in a line, and you will be cast into Harmon. And we don't really know where Harmon is, but it's, it's going to be a place of destruction. Maybe it's on the other side of Conroe, isn't it? Anybody? I'm not sure where Harmon is, but but there, it's going to be a bad uh, situation for them. Come to Bethel and transgress, and Gilgal multiply transgressions. And that's what they were doing. They said, come on, just, you know, you've been doing it, just keep on doing it. Bring your sacrifice each morning, your tithes every three days. See, they were engaged in religious practices, no doubt about that. But it was religious practices without conviction, and certainly not in harmony with God's will. He said, offer a sacrifice and thanksgiving with eleven, proclaim and announce the free will offerings. For this you love. You remember how the uh, you know the Pharisees like the, the praise of men? Uh, it, it's sort of the same kind of deal. Uh, the the uh, publican, you know, he he wouldn't even raise his head to heaven, but Lord his head and beat his breast. And the uh, other fellow said, well, I'm glad I'm not like him. But that's what the, these folks were doing. Proclaim and announce the free will offerings. You love this. Uh, verse 6. 
Also, I gave you cleanliness of teeth in all your cities. That means they didn't have any food. And lack of bread in all your places. And these were signs that they should repent. You know, the Lord said he wouldn't do anything unless he had told them first. Yet you have not returned to me. I also withheld rain from you. Uh, made it rain in one city, withheld rain from another city. And they were so thirsty that uh, two or three cities wandered to another city to find water, but they weren't satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me. Verse 9, there's another uh, encouragement to repent. I blasted you with blight and mildew when your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees. The locusts devoured them. But still you haven't returned to me. Verse 10, I sent a uh, plague among you after the manner of Egypt. We know about the ten plagues of Egypt. Your young men I killed with a sword, along with uh, your captive horses. I made the stench in your camps come up in your nostrils. That may be because of the, the death, you know, the, the uh, putrefaction of those who had died. But still, you haven't returned to me. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. But still you didn't return to me. Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Prepare to meet your punishment. Prepare to meet your doom. And he gives the reason why he is able to do this. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates a wind, who declares to man what his thought is, and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth, the Lord of her host is his name. He can do it, and he will do it. So we'll take up the uh, third week. I'm going to be gone for two Wednesdays. So the third Wednesday, we'll take up chapter 5. And uh, David is going to have the next two Wednesday nights, and I think what he intends to do is have a question and answer session for both of those Wednesday nights. So if you can get questions to him by at least Sunday, uh, that'd be appreciated. I know that if he got some Monday, he may do it the succeeding Wednesday night. <laughs> We'll try to get the questions to him by this coming Sunday. Appreciate it very much. Thank you for your kind attention.